Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast for water treaters by water treaters, where we're scaling up on water treatment knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Hi, everybody. I am Trace Blackmore, and I cannot tell you how excited I am to read the metrics on Scaling Up. Folks, can you believe it? We are getting 1,500 downloads per month. Unbelievable. Thank you guys for downloading it. Thank you for telling your friends in the water treatment industry that this is something that can help us get a little bit better and spark some ideas. I got to tell you, I am super excited. I had no idea it would get this popular so quickly. And the only reason that this is happening is because you are helping the cause. Thank you so much for spreading the word. A couple of things about what's coming up in the near future. September 13th through 16th, AWT is having their annual convention in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So please, if you have not signed up for that, you definitely want to do that. You want to make your reservations. You want to make sure that you are there. That is by far the only place you can go that is a one-stop shop where you can get information about what's going on in the industry and see every single potential vendor that you will ever need in your water treatment career. It's amazing what happens at the AWT conventions. And if you're not there, you're going to miss it. So please, if you haven't made those reservations, you want to go ahead and get that done. Also, some other things with AWT. There are so many free webinars that AWT puts on that I am shocked that many of us do not take advantage of. So if you have not gone online to see what webinars are available, I urge you to do so because there's a lot of information out there. And if you are an AWT member, it is free for the taking. So please take advantage of that. And by the way, if you're listening to me and you're not an AWT member, what the heck is going on with that? There is so much that the Association of Water Technologies has to offer us water treaters. I am amazed when I talk to other water treaters that aren't members of AWT. Go online, go to awt.org, check it out. There's just so much stuff under there. You can't go wrong. It's definitely worth the money. I highly recommend it. Last thing I'll mention is the CWT. And folks, I'm going to do a show on the Certified Water Technologist designation process. I'm going to interview people that have taken the test, both on the remote options and then also when they have taken it after the technical training seminars. I'm also going to have the queen of certification herself on, Angela Pike, and she's going to tell us exactly how we need to head down the road to certification, how we get certified, and then once we are certified, how we keep that designation up to date. So stay tuned for future episodes. We're going to talk all about that. Well, on today's episode, I thought we would talk a little bit about finance and how we manage things that go along with that. So our guest today is going to be Mike Iverson, who's actually our CFO. So I think he's just a wonderful guy. He has an understanding of all these things financial. And the cool thing about Mike is he's able to put it in a way that you can understand it. Not only you can understand it, I can understand it. And from that, we're able to make informed decisions based on that information. But before we get to Mike, I get a lot of questions about what the difference is between a deaerator and a feed water tank. So we're going to start out with talking about that. So what the heck is the difference between a feed water tank and a deaerator? They're exactly the same thing except for one difference. That difference is pressure. So the feed water tank has no pressure. The deaerator does have pressure. The whole purpose for the feed water tank and the, and the DA tank is to drive off oxygen. They do this with heat. The mechanical means of driving off oxygen is we heat it up. Oxygen is inverse soluble and it is going up through that discharge pipe that's on the top of the tank as a vent. So why is one under pressure and one isn't? 
Well, you can only get water so hot before it does a phase change and, and changes into steam. The way you get water hotter is you put it under pressure. So, and that's exactly what it is. We want to keep it in the water state, but we want to put more BTUs in it. We want to get it hotter. So how do we do that? Well, we'll think back to your grandmother's method of cooking. And she probably had a pressure cooker in her kitchen arsenal somewhere. And the pressure cooker, the way it will work and why you can cook things faster in a pressure cooker is we can get the water in the food hotter so it can cook better or can cook faster rather. So the more pressure we put, the more we hold that water as water and don't allow it to convert over to steam, i.e. the hotter that water can get. If we go back to our feed water DA situation, a feed water tank can only get to 212 degrees and still be water. And 212 degrees is something we were never going to run the feed water tank up to because we would have issues with cavitation. What that is, a real fancy name, if you can imagine the impeller of the pump, we are creating a low pressure area right around that impeller where it's sucking the water out of the tank and pushing it to the boiler. Well, that low pressure is enough to create that water that's 212 degrees or around that to start to boil and we can devastate that pump impeller. So normally, 190 is about the max we want to keep a feed water pump at. But we said oxygen is inverse soluble, and the hotter that we can get it, the more we can drive off that oxygen. So with the DA tank, we can take that up to maybe 240 or 250 before it starts to boil because it's under pressure. And this is where tables come in because they can tell you under what pressure how many BTUs or how hot the water can actually be as water. The hotter it is, the more we can drive off the oxygen. And that's why the deaerator is preferred as a pretreatment or feed water treatment before we go into the boiler. In a feed water tank or a deaerator tank, you probably are pumping in some sort of oxygen scavenger. And we're going to go ahead and use sulfite in this explanation. Now, I've seen way too many times people take a port off or a plug off of the very top of a feed water tank, and they'll just stick a tube off their chemical pump down there, and they just squirt sulfite in there. Please don't do this. Think about what sulfite's job is. Sulfite is to get rid of that oxygen, but it's to get rid of the oxygen that's in the water, not what's in the air. So if you're squirting from the top of the tank down into the water line, it's going to work on all that air that's in there. You're just wasting product and adding needless dissolved solids into the boiler. So the proper way to feed sulfite into either a feed water tank or a deaerator is several inches below the water line to ensure you're always underneath the water line and then going in through an injection nozzle a couple inches to make sure you're getting it away from the metal and it's actually going into the water. So that is the proper way to feed sulfite. And by the way, we're only feeding sulfite in the deaerator or the feed water tank, and we're not feeding any other product. We could feed polymer or something like that if we wanted to, but my preference is to feed all the other stuff in the locations that it belongs. So if you have an all-in-one treatment, you could not feed that into the feed water or deaerator because the pH is so high, you're actually going to do damage to the system. So your sulfide is only fed in the feed water deaerator tank. All your other products are fed directly into the boiler or in the feed water line as close to the boiler as possible with the exception of, of the mean treatment, of the steam line treatment. Now you can feed it into the boiler and it will volatilize over, meaning it will go up with the steam. But the preferred way to feed that is to actually go into the steam header and feed it directly there. That way we're not wasting any in the water or blowing it down. It's immediately volatilizing with that steam and we're just using what we need. So but we're not talking about that today. We're talking about the feed water tank and the deaerator. So let's talk about the feed water tank. The feed water tank should be about 190 degrees. There's something called a spurging valve there. And basically it's just this long tube with a bunch of holes in it that is putting steam to heat the water. And there's a spring controlled thermostat on it 
that normally is not adjusted properly. And nobody besides you has ever looked at the temperature and talked to the customer and said, told them that proper management of the feed water is making sure that we have about 190 degrees. And by the way, right now it's 50 degrees. Well, that's huge. If we were to look at how much sulfite it takes to neutralize oxygen at 50 degrees, and I want to say there's like 11 parts per million of oxygen at 50, where there's like two at 190, we're putting in so much extra product there. It's going to make it needlessly more expensive because we've got to overcome all this extra oxygen. Plus, we're putting all these extra solids in the boiler. That's going to mean that we're going to have to blow it down more often. Not just blowing the water down, but blowing all the heat that's in that water. So by simply just adjusting that thermostat, we can get that up to the proper temperature and we're going to make that system a lot more efficient. On a previous show, I mentioned that we are the original green industry. And this is why. You don't throw chemical at every problem. You want to make sure that you understand how the systems work. And now you're there to make sure that the system can talk to the owner properly. And you're going to make sure that things are operating to their utmost efficiency. So get that feed water up to 190 degrees. And you want to make sure that you're recording the temperature of the feed water on your service report. On the DA tank, depending on the design... It could be different pressures and different temperatures. So be sure you know which one you have, know what it's designed for, and then that's the limit that you want to you want to keep that pressure and steam. Now you're not going to adjust any of this, but you're going to record the pressure and the temperature. And when you're recording the pressure and temperature, it should be within that zone that the manufacturer says. If it's not, you're going to talk with your customer and have them get it back within that range. So I hope that sheds a little bit more light on the feed water tank and the deaerator. And next time you see one of those, you'll be able to identify those based on what their functionality is. And you're going to look at them as a efficiency manager to make sure that they're operating properly. My lab partner today is Mike Iverson. Mike Iverson is actually Blackmore Enterprises part-time CFO. How are you doing today, Mike? Doing great, Trace. Mike, really glad you're here. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about finances, but I use the term part-time CFO. Do you mind explaining to our audience, what the heck does that mean? Sure, sure. Well, thank you again for having me. Well, part-time CFO I mean, is someone who you actually hire out, and I work with multiple clients, not just one, and I'm not actually a full-time employee with a client. I'm actually their outsourced CFO, and that way, my clients can get the expertise from a CFO level individual, but not have to hire somebody full time and pay that type of level of pay for that type of expertise. So I've worked with companies from all you know industries and walks of life, everyone from a healthcare company to professional services, engineering, and of course, with a great service like yours at Blackmore Enterprises. All right. Extra points for that. Good. <laughs> Well, Mike, you have a you have a, a niche for being able to explain really difficult financial terms in a very easy way to understand. Mm. And that's why I'm excited about having you on our program today. Yeah. I was hoping that you could share with our audience what are some some basic key financial items that everybody should should really know. Sure, sure. And you know, it's interesting because it's not just business owners, but you, you know, as you've mentioned, we've got folks that work within a water treatment business that are in techs. And so, you know, you can be an owner, but also as a tech, you'll have a territory that you're going to cover to help service the business's clients. So you actually yourself have a little business unto itself, a subset of the company. So there's different metrics that you want to look at, whether you're a business owner or whether you're a tech. So let's look at the tech, for example, going out and visiting and servicing clients. You want to make sure that if I'm a tech, how am I going to organize, for instance, this week and make sure that I get to my clients in the most efficient way so that I spend the least amount of time in terms of spending traveling and how do I organize it so I can get there? And that would help reduce the cost for the business because I get it done quicker because at the end of the day, time is money. And so if we're able to limit the amount of time, say, for instance, travel time, then we limit the amount of cost. So kind of organizing my week and making sure that I am 
logistically lining up my client services in a way that is the most efficient. For a business owner, you're going to have other drivers too. You're not only going to have that, but you'll have drivers in terms of, and I'll kind of label them seven, sometimes eight financial drivers, for example, in a business. One is sales. Am I growing? Am I flat or am I declining? Gross profit margin. Do I have the right gross profit margin? Is it in line with what I expect? Do I also have the overhead expenses in check? So are those expenses growing or declining or staying fixed relative to the growth of the business? How am I doing with my customers? I build my customers. How quickly do I collect from my customers? So I want to make sure that that's as short as possible. Inventory. I have to have inventory on hand to service my customers. The question is, how much can I have on hand? How quickly can I make sure that when I bring it in the door, it doesn't sit too long in my warehouse so that I can get it out and get it out to the customer, service the account, turn it into billable revenue. And then I've also got payments that I've got to make to my vendors. So how can I make sure that I get my vendors structured in a way that I can pay right on time, but I can get the best credit terms possible with my vendors so that way I can take as long as possible with the right terms, but yet pay within that time frame and have great vendor relations. Because my vendors are a key component of my business as well. Not just the customers themselves, but I gotta have good vendors in order to support my business. And then I look at, you know, profit. What's my net profit margin? So at the end of the day, there's a percentage of profit that I want to make sure that I have left over in the business. So if I don't have profit, then I can't take some of that profit and reinvest it back into the company for future growth. And that's really critical. I also look at, you know, my debt. If I have debt on my books, you know, debt with banks is what most companies do have. And if so, how do I make sure I manage that appropriately so that I don't find myself over leveraged, as they say, which means too much debt or not enough maybe in order to invest in some of the things that will help my company grow. So those are just a, a few related to a business owner and then one related to the tax, making sure in terms of the logistics and how I get out there and service my clients. Great advice. And I know you have a newsletter. If somebody wanted to learn more information about those topics, mm-hmm. how would they easily do that? Sure. Well, they can go to Trillium Financial. Dot com And on there, they'll actually go right to the landing page and there's a sign up for a newsletter. What we do is we do a monthly newsletter and then we also do a monthly tip of the month. So we'll highlight certain financial metrics that we follow or some things that are related to business, but also personal because business and personal finance are actually kind of one and the same. And we'll give tips to our, our audience and, and target. Them. Okay. Well, I'll, and I'll make sure to put a link on the website for that as well. Great. Well, you mentioned some key things that the business needs to do. Just as an individual, me keeping my personal finances, what are some things that I should be looking at or some of our listeners should be looking at? Sure. So when you you think about business and you think about personal, as I've said, you know, small companies are often one and the same. So what we do in business or what we do in personal kind of cross-pollinate. So one of the rules I have is we want to always be able to take action on some opportunities that come up. So people always ask the question of, well, then how much cash should I have on hand, for example? What do I need for an emergency fund? And there's a lot of experts out there that have different opinions around it. And I do too. I have different opinions around it as well. And that's all it really is. It's just someone's thought or opinion on it. But I typically like to see both for a company, but also from a personal perspective, you know, three to six months. And the reason is it gives you a chance to react to a situation that comes up that either requires you to dip into that and to be able to pay for it and not have to go, oops, you know, how am I going to do that? I don't have the cash. Where am I going to go find it? So an example might be on a personal level, it might be a medical bill that all of a sudden there's a medical condition that all cropped up or as would happen with me, one of my daughters, you know, plays soccer. She's a great little soccer player. But unfortunately, one day she got hit so hard that she ended up with a concussion. But we spent that half a day at the hospital with x-rays and all that good stuff. So I had to make sure I could take care of that on a personal side. From a business side, same idea. It could be, you know what? We have this piece of equipment that's running in the background. It's one of our analyzers, for example, and it just broke down. And now I've got a, a client that is relying on that to get his reports back out to him, and I need to get a new analyzer. So I need to have the capital available in order for that to happen. And 
for me, that's making sure we have enough adequate cash on hand to deal with those emergencies. Well, I just realized you have triplets, so you kind of applied that same philosophy. You have you have two extra spares if something were to happen to one. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> it does. It's triple trouble, as there they would go. say. Yes. <laughs> and that's actually how you got the name of your business. Is that correct? That is correct. You know, ironically, someone always told me, you know, when you do step out and you place a name on your business, they said, tell a story. And that is one of the stories, the story behind it. I, I do have three girls. And so the way it came about is on the third millennium and the third month, on the third day of that month, we found out we were having triplets. Oh, wow. So Trillium represents that try and the millennium. So that's how the name came up. Well, I know you. your fun reading is reading about finances and what's going on with the economy and, and all that stuff that none of us other people actually read. So you're really good on this stuff. <laughs> so with all these things that you're reading, what is your outlook for the economy? Sure, sure. You know, what I'm looking at is in all the reading that I do and the folks that I follow, the, the outlook is we're going to have a strong 2018 and into 19, early part of 19. But they do see that there are going to be some headwinds coming around the end of 19. So anticipate potentially a mild recession at the end of 19, sometime around there into 20. And so just be mindful that it will be coming up. So what do you do? Well, right now you're going to take advantage of the growth and the opportunity of that growth that we see here in 2018. Plan for being able to, we see the market getting a little tighter and with that demand is rising. And so with that, you might be able to have some price elasticity. So look at some pricing opportunities with your customers. And then as you come into the 2019, just be mindful of having some of the cash and some of the the banking that you, lines of credit or capital available, just so that when that does happen and it starts to slow down, you're able to take advantage of that. And that advantage might be you're still holding on to all your key employees, or you're able to actually go into some marketing activities that allows you to grab into penetration further into the market space and take advantage of that at that point in time. Is there any one particular piece of advice that you could say we could do today to prepare for that slight recession tomorrow? For me, from a financial perspective, Mm -hmm. I guess it's really going to look at your, if I'm a business owner, my, my balance sheet, make sure is it clean? Do I have it so that it feels I've got the right amount of inventory. My receivables are in a good spot. They're not overextended. I'm not overextended with my customers. I've got the right credit terms with my customers. And also with my vendors, I've got good credit terms with my vendors. I'm not paying too fast, but I'm also not paying slow. Just make sure I'm in good shape so that as I walk into 2019, I've got the financial resources on my balance sheet to continue to be in the attack mode and be into the growth mode. You know, every two to three years, the Association of Water Technologies does a survey of all the businesses that are within the AWT and creates that benchmarking survey. And I know you and I use that benchmarking survey quite a bit. Right. A lot of our members are hesitant to fill that information out. But I really feel that as a business owner, especially as you and I being a team, we make a lot of decisions based on that. Is there anything that you could say to those people listening that maybe they want to reconsider those for certain reasons? Oh, certainly. You know, as a business owner, when you think about it, what better way to have industry metrics that you can benchmark yourself against? And I know with some of my clients, we have to go search and hope that we find some benchmarking numbers that might match up to what they do. So oftentimes people will go, well, let me look up my, you know, a sick code and see what that looks like and try to measure myself against some data that pulls up in a database that really has thousands of companies, some private, some public, that some are kind of within the industry or sort of on the edge of it. Some of them are outside of it. And so we're sort of benchmarking ourselves against some numbers that might not really correlate very well. So to have an industry metric pulled up by those who are in the association, oh my gosh, that is a huge win. And that's a win really for everybody because then you can, you know, take that and you can slice it and dice it in a couple of different ways in terms of size, in terms of geography, in terms of location, as well as maybe even some specialties within it. And be able to measure yourself against somebody is tremendous because otherwise 
really you're driving against yourself, which is important. It's important to measure yourself year in and year out, but to also measure yourself against some who are you're in competition with and or maybe not even in competition, but they're in another part of the country, but you're measuring yourself and seeing, am I improving? Am I at least within where I want to be in terms of, of those numbers? It's very important. So to, to address, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I subscribe to a, a database that actually has, I think it's about 5,000 private companies subscribe to and, and put their, their numbers to. And I know a number of companies, actually some fairly large multi-billion dollar companies that contribute to a, a database. The information's, you know, proprietary. The information does not get out in terms of where we know that this is Blackmore Enterprises numbers and it's published out here. I have not found any industry associations that I've been a, a part of where we haven't had great proprietary confidential information that really benefits the members more so than, than anything else. And I highly recommend it because it really gives you a robust set of information that you would otherwise not have and not know. And it's not any different. It's like planning. When you decide to create a plan, a strategic plan, and you want to go from point A to point B, and I equate this to taking a vacation and I'm going to drive from here in Atlanta, Georgia uh, to San Francisco. Well, I want a roadmap. And in that roadmap, I know how many miles it's going to take because that map has shown and has documented and people have contributed to that map saying it's going to take you this amount of miles to go to Birmingham. If you go from Birmingham over to Little Rock, it's this. So that way, you know, I can have an efficient way to figure out where do I need to make my stops and how do I get to San Francisco in the most efficient way as well as benchmarking myself in terms of time. And that's no different than collecting this data. And so I highly recommend members to do that. So don't be scared. It's highly confidential. Yes. You're going to get a lot of information out of it. And the more sample sets of data we have, the better the data is. Correct. That is correct. You definitely want a good set of data and a large sample set because the more you have, then the better the data can be then distilled as well as taken across different sizes of companies. Absolutely. Well, I know you work with a lot of businesses and also a lot of individuals within those businesses. What's one of the biggest mistakes that you commonly see? I'm going to bring it back to, there's a saying, what gets measured gets done. Hmm. And what I often see is there's not actually a, a formal way that folks sit down and measure their metrics. And that can be both financial and operational. And if you don't, then what you're really doing is you're just sort of driving blind. You're just, you're out there and you're reacting to situations instead of being proactive into the situation. So I highly recommend, I see what the the biggest thing I see is, is just sitting down and going, what is it that we want to measure that really drives our business? What drives our, the servicing of our tech territories? What drives that? So make sure that you sit down and go, what are those? as a team, collectively and collaboratively, and then say, if it's these five, then let's sit down and each month, let's go through those on a regular basis. It might be each month, maybe it's every quarter, but do it regularly. Because if you don't look at it until the end of the year, when you're doing your taxes or whatnot, I mean, it's too late. And that I think is one of the the biggest mistakes that, that folks do is they just don't measure it. So Start measuring. Start measuring. Would you recommend that people set a goal to what those measurements should be? I would. I would. And some folks will say, well, I don't know what the goal should look like. At the end of the day, at least start and then go back and say, if you've got some history, go, well, this is where we're at now. So we want to improve upon that. So what do we want to improve upon? How much? Do we want 10% better? Do we want 20% better? What do we think as a team we can do better than we did last year? And use that as a guide to start you off. And then if you get these industry metrics, then you can actually go, okay, well, now we're going to measure ourselves against those metrics as well. So that way we've got, here's where we were and here's where we want to go, we think. And based on the industry metrics, it looks like we're on the right track or we're not. Well, my final question is the bonus question. Are you ready for this? We're ready. All right. Fire so, away. So, so just a little insight about who you are. So... If you could have a conversation with anyone in history, 
who would it be and why? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. Well, what first pops into my head is I'd love to have a conversation with Abraham Lincoln. Why? Abraham Lincoln went through a whole bunch of adversity. I mean, I didn't realize that he was a businessman. He was a lawyer. And he arrived in some businesses that then went bankrupt. And he found a way to get his voice out and be heard in such a way that he eventually became, you know, the president of the United States. And he was an unknown, complete unknown in terms of those that were the powers that be at the time. So to have a conversation with him and to hear the continual, how do you persist through some of the personal and business ups and downs was amazing. And then he was in one of the most tumultuous periods of our country's history. And he persevered through that. That takes an incredible amount of leadership and the skill and the, the sometimes really the audacity to work your way through it, even when you're being told it's not going to work. You know, he still stepped out and said, this is what I believe. It's in my gut. It just seems right. And so having a conversation with someone like that to me would be like transformational. But Mike, you're one of those guys that I actually look forward to our meetings and talking about finance and the fact yeah. we're actually talking about numbers and finance yeah. is, you know, something that doesn't excite a lot of people, but you do it in a fun and positive way. And I appreciate you coming on the show and, and not only helping our business, but helping the businesses and the individuals that listen to this program. Well, absolutely. Thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Well, I sure hope you enjoyed that interview with Mike Iverson. I really enjoy Mike Iverson and his ability to put very complex financial issues in a very simple way so we can understand them and then we can use that information to make decisions. And I hope by now you realize as a water treater, it's not just about understanding chemistry. As a well-rounded water treater, we need to understand chemistry. We need to understand finance, electricity, plumbing. The list goes on. Never stop learning as a water treater. And honestly, I can't think of another trade where there's so many things, so many areas that we have to learn. It's been a couple of episodes since I've answered some of the questions that you've sent to me on ScalingUpH2O.com. So I want to make sure that we answer some of your questions today. Before I do that, I want to go back to something that I said earlier in this episode where we were talking about the best location to feed a means is in the steam header. And traditionally, that is the best place to feed a means, unless if you're talking about the new film forming a means, which those are ideally fed into the feed water tank, deaerator, or feed water line. So make sure you speak with your supplier to make sure you're getting the right information on that and you're feeding those in the right location. And I mention that because Logan of Odyssey Environment stopped by Blackmore Enterprises last week to tell us all about some of the new film forming amines, and it really is cool, some of the things that they're designing out there. And Logan wanted to make sure that I knew the proper feed location, so I wanna pass that along to you. And the reason I want to mention Logan is because Logan said he really enjoyed my show, and he likes to listen to it when he travels on planes. He says he loves to listen to my accent. And for those of you that know Logan, this is actually very cool because he's French and I think he's got a pretty cool accent. That being said, let's get to some of your questions on Pinks and Blues. The question that I get the most is about corrosion coupons and specifically about how they should be oriented in the actual corrosion coupon rack. So what I want you to do, I want you to visualize a corrosion coupon rack. Now what I hope you are visualizing is a correctly oriented corrosion coupon rack. So corrosion coupon racks should be oriented horizontally and the flow should be approaching from the bottom. So from the bottom, coming into a 90 degree where your first corrosion coupon will go 
And notice that in this example, it is in the direct line of flow. It's not against flow, it's with flow. We're going to go out about a foot or so, we're going to elbow up, we're going to come up, and then we're going to put another corrosion coupon. So it sort of looks like a zigzag, but it's important that the flow is approached from the bottom going up, and the corrosion coupons are always installed with the flow. They shouldn't be attacking the flow from the other end. If you've ever done corrosion coupon cleaning or studies or anything like that, you can actually see where that can give you some erosion corrosion. So that being said, how do you put corrosion coupons in the proper orientation? Well, if you use the galvanic series and you understand the galvanic series, this is very simple. However, I'm not going to bore you today anyway, maybe on another show, about the galvanic series. What I'm simply going to do is tell you where the most common metallurgies need to go, and then you can put those in your corrosion coupons. So the very first one that you would want to put in would be aluminum. And then after the aluminum, again, going with the line of flow, the next one would be carbon steel. The next one after that would be your copper. And the final one would be your stainless steel. So if you put those in that order, you shouldn't have any issues. For those of you that did not know that there was a correct order, I'm willing to bet that you put a mild steel coupon in and a copper coupon in in the wrong order, and you take those out after about a month or two or three or four or however many it is, and you say, I don't remember putting two copper coupons in there. So that's the reason that we want to make sure we have them in the correct orientation. Oh, by the way, the reason that you want to always have the flow coming from the bottom of the corrosion coupon rack is you want to make sure there's no air pockets in there. You want to make sure that thing is completely flooded. So hopefully now that gives you a little bit of information on corrosion coupons. And we mentioned AWT earlier. There are some great white papers out there on corrosion coupons and understanding where to put everything in the system and also understanding what the flow rates need to be. Just about everything you could ever ask for when it comes to corrosion coupon sampling. So please go online and look for that. That's valuable information. Another question that I get, and I'm a little apprehensive to bring this up on the show, but I got several requests for people to advertise on Scaling Up. And folks, I got to tell you, I don't know how I feel about that yet. I want to make sure that my listening audience understands that I am trying to get information out to them. However, there are some expenses and various things with the show, so I haven't really decided whether I'm going to take advertisers or not. So for those of you that are emailing me and asking me that they would like to sponsor a show and they'd like to do some advertising, be patient with me. I'm still trying to figure that out. Once I do... I promise I'll get in contact with you. And for those listeners out there, I'm sort of curious to what you think. What do you think if there were advertisers on this show? How would that affect the show? Let me know what you think, because that would definitely drive my decision. Another question, and this is the last question that I'll answer on today's show, is for somebody who has a pH meter, and this person asks, how do I know if my pH meter is really accurate if I'm out of buffer? Well, my first thing that I would say is get some new buffer. Always have buffer in your test kit so that way you're able to test your meter appropriately and calibrate that. But if you don't, hopefully you've got some pH color indicator in there, specifically phenol failing. So phenol failing will turn pink at 8.3 and above. So if you get a pH of 7.5 on your meter and you put some phenolphthalein in there and it turns pink, you do not have an accurate reading on that meter. You can inverse that as well. So phenolphthalein, unlike your meter, does not need to be calibrated. It simply does not know how to lie. It knows the only thing it can do, which is to turn pink at 8.3 and above. I appreciate that you're sending questions in, so please keep those coming. This is a lot of fun for me to do. I truly am humbled by the amount of people that talk to me and tell me that they're listening to the show, they really like the show. And when I look and see that we're getting 1,500 downloads in a month's time, that actually, I read that incorrectly. It's 1,500 downloads per episode. That's pretty impressive. 
I'm only able to say this because you guys are out there supporting me. I appreciate everything that you're doing. And together, we're going to make sure that we're treating this industry that my father taught me to respect as a water treater. We're all going to respect it together. We're going to learn a little bit tomorrow more than we knew today. And we're going to be a better water treater tomorrow than we were today. I hope you have a great day. And I hope you join us next time for Scaling Up.